so I'll do a little bit of review, uh, work with you, okay? There was, um, were you here last night? Oh, you did. Okay, so you, you got that. So the three main covenants that we were looking at is the, the foundational covenant is which covenant that Psalms is working with? The Abrahamic covenant, right. Because all the promises that come from God ultimately are coming through that uh, Abrahamic covenant. And the Mosaic covenant is the second one. You can s clearly see the Mosaic covenant in Psalm 1 and Psalm 2. Um, in Psalm 1, the emphasis is on meditating upon the Word, okay, on the law. That's the emphasis of the Mosaic law. Um, and, um, and then in uh, Psalm 2, it's the, the, the law, of course, is linked especially to um, Zion, my holy hill. Because Mount Zion, Mount Zion is where God has come to rest. And so the tabernacle is at Mount Zion, eventually a temple. By the time this book is put together, um, 500 years after the temple is built, or 400 years after the temple is built, um, you're not dealing theologically with a tabernacle, but with a temple. So we have, the first one is the Abrahamic covenant, the second one is the Mosaic covenant, the Mosaic Covenant was for what purpose? One of the great purposes of the Mosaic Law was to do what? It was to show that God kept all His promises to Abraham. It was to show that God kept all His promises to Abraham. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt. Okay? Therefore, you may not eat animals unless the cud goes down and it comes up. I, wa I want you to understand that I'm the one who did this and you'll eat food that will remind your, you and your children every time you eat by what you eat that I kept my promises to Father Abraham. That though he was one man, you will eat food that comes in huge numbers. You can eat deer. You can eat fish. You can eat turtle doves. You can eat lamb. You can eat goat. You can eat uh, cow. Okay? But you may not eat falcon. You may not eat uh, creatures that come <coughs> that do not come in huge numbers. Because I'm the Lord your God who said you'd be as numerous as the stars of the sky. Again, purposely causing you to eat animals. <coughs> you may not eat animals that crawl on the belly. Because I'm the Lord your God that when you came out of Egypt, you came out as the sons of the living God, standing tall. Where when you were in Egypt, you were bent over like beasts of burden with your face pushed down to the ground with heavy loads. You, you stood tall, coming out as the sons of the living God. Okay? You may, eat, you may not eat animals that eat other animals. Okay? You are the peacemakers. Through your seed, all nations will be blessed. Therefore, you, the, you're the sons of God and you will be the peacemakers of the world. You will bring light and blessing to those who will follow the God of Abraham. So the Mosaic Law celebrates that God kept all his promises. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt. Therefore, you shall have no other gods besides me. The Ten Commandments are based on God fulfilling the Abrahamic covenant. I said I would bring, I'd take you down and I said I'd bring you out. Well, I brought you up. Here you are. Therefore, you shall worship Yahweh alone. You shall not make any graven image. You shall not misuse his name. Okay? I promised Abraham I would give him rest. And that he'd be in the gates of his enemies in the future. That this land would be his and for his seed. But before that, uh, you will go down and you will be afflicted for many, many years. And 400 years later, I will bring you up. And I'll punish those who had harmed you. But I will give you rest in this land. The Mosaic Covenant, the sign of the Mosaic Covenant is Sabbath, which is rest. I gave you rest from your burden. I will give you rest from your enemies. The Mosaic Law celebrates the rest he gave them 
and looks forward to the rest he's going to give them. And God says, if you obey me, you will certainly find rest in the land. If you do not obey me, the land will spew you out. So the Mosaic Covenant is to celebrate that God kept all his promises in all kinds of ways. How you wear your clothing, how you do your farming, um, how you, what choice of food, who you're allowed to give your daughters to and your sons to in marriage. Just a, a thousand ways. Okay? And But it didn't work. They disobeyed. And once they were in the land, they worshipped the other gods. And they gave their daughters and sons to other people who worship other gods. And it didn't work. And God would raise up judges different times, but every 40, 50 years, and try and bring them back. In the end, everyone did what was right in his own eyes. The Hebrew is everyone did what was good in his own eyes. Good and evil. And, and what they thought was good, God found to be evil. Eventually what they decided was, we want to be like the other nations, so they chose a, a king. And God understood they had rejected a king himself. Because they wanted a king so they'd be like all the other nations. Where they were a unique nation, where God was their king in a very special way. But they wanted to be like the other nations. And so God says, if you want to be like everyone else, the only way you could do that is you'd have to reject me. Because if you have me, you are not like any other nation. And they rejected God. And so again, God says, well, okay, you put confidence in the, in the flesh. Not in a God you cannot see, but in gods you make with your own hands. And the nations do that. And, they'll, and they would get a king who is bigger than everyone else. And so I'll give you Saul. He's a head taller than all the other men. And you'll look like what the nations would choose. And he puts confidence in the flesh. And so the Bible says that God gave a king in his anger and he took him away in his wrath. Because really, Saul was nothing more than a stepping stone to get to eventually what God wants, which is a man after his own heart. Okay, a man that would not put confidence in the, in the flesh. You see, Israel are the people who are not to put confidence in the flesh. I'll explain it. They are the children of circumcision, which means they put no confidence in the flesh. How does that work? In, uh, in Genesis chapter 17, I believe, the doctrine of circumcision. Um, God said to Abraham that you need to get yourself and all your men circumcised. Now you have to understand, he's in the land of his enemies. Canaanites everywhere around. But God does something that's very strange. He does not say, get circumcised, but he assumes, get circumcised today all on the same day and that's the key is that they're all going to get circumcised on the same day the point is whether they're born in you your, in your, among your people or you bought them there'll be no males that will not be circumcised right from the little ones right up to the old men but it will also take in all your warriors in between. And it says that Abraham um, had himself and all his men circumcised, all the males, on that day, on a single day. We have a later story where Shechem attacked um, Israel by the son of the king of Shechem, I think it's Shechem. Pretty sure it's Shechem. Um, and seduced Dana, Dinah. And he said, I really love this girl, and so I want, I want your dad to talk to these guys, and, and I want her as a wife. 
And so then what happened is the boys knew what they had, he had done to Dinah. And they said, it would not be right for us to give our sister to those who are uncircumcised, to the foreskins. That's what the Hebrews, it would not be right to give our daughter to the foreskins. And, he, and these two, um, Simeon and Levi, convince all the men to get circumcised on the same day. Because he loves this girl so much, he convinces dad that we should all do this. And the whole city, all the males get circumcised on that day. Guess what? They show up three days later on the third day. That's not accidental. Why the third day? Because everyone knows in circumcision, it'll be on the third day, you will be as good as dead. And it says on the third day they showed up and two men slaughtered every single person. All the males. And what the Hebrew Bible is trying to show you is that Israel are the children that put no confidence in the no male, flesh. Because if you had every single man circumcised on one day, on the third day, no one could pick up a shield, no one could pick up a sword, no one could defend himself. And God could have said, we're going to do 10% of the men every day. And you would have 70% of your men that would not be at, that would be at probably somewhat fit. But God says, no. Every single male on this day. And so you could count the days. And the boys know what day it would be that you'd be most vulnerable. It will be the third day. Your first day after circumcision, you'll be sore, but you will not be in pain. The second day, you will be even sore, but not in pain. But by the third day, you will not be able to lift up a shield or a spear. spear. Meaning, the covenant of circumcision is a willingness for Abraham to obey God where he considers himself and his people as good as dead. And the question is, will, will we be alive on the, help me out, third day? That's picked up in the New Testament, big time. That Christ was buried, that Christ was crucified, he was buried, and he was raised from the dead on the third day, according to the Scriptures. He is the fulfillment of the covenant of circumcision. Because Jesus put no confidence in the flesh. And we've heard this craziness. It's now the third day, and we hear that he's actually a what? Alive. He's alive. Israel, we're to be the people that put no confidence in the flesh. Circumcision, <clears throat> uh, for some who believe in infant baptism, is a symbol that regeneration has nothing to do with choice. That's why you circumcise. That's why you baptize babies. They link the baptism of babies to circumcision because later in Israel's history, you circumcise a child when he's eight days old. Are, are you following me? But what you need to understand is <coughs> um, you circumcise that child of eight days old as a sign and a symbol to God that you know that if God had not shown up and kept your enemies at bay, bay, this child would not exist. This child exists because I said to you, live. And the Canaanites didn't come after you. I said, by decree, do not let anyone harm my anointed ones. Book of Psalms. Let me say it again. <clears throat> the scriptures, the scriptures are based on a fundamental fundamental covenant, the Abrahamic covenant. And it is only, it is only benefits those who put no confidence in the flesh. But who believe in a God that you cannot see. And as long as you're going to put confidence in your flesh, you will eventually find out you are not the beneficiaries of the Abrahamic covenant. Okay? But when you build idols with your own hands, that's confidence in your 
flesh. When you're Solomon and you make alliances through all these women and make treaties, that's confidence in the, in the flesh. When you choose not to hold back your son and you put a knife over him and you're going to turn him into smoke, that means you're a man who puts no confidence in the flesh. And God puts no confidence in the flesh, and neither did Jesus. And so what we need to understand is David is a man who does not put confidence in the, in the flesh. And that's why as you read the Psalms again and again and again, who is he crying out to for help? Is it armies? Is it soldiers? Is it people? It's always the, it's the Lord. It's the Lord. He's looking to the God he cannot see to help him again and again and again. When he doesn't deserve any trouble and when he's brought trouble on himself. Either way, he knows the only one who can help him is the God that he cannot see. Okay? Why do you have a Davidic covenant? Because God gave David the throne through Samuel, through anointing, okay? When Saul proved he was not worthy of a dynasty. And then Saul would not accept that. And eventually God took Saul's life and Jonathan's and his brother's lives. And David became the king of Israel. He is not promised a dynasty when the oil's put on him. He is not promised a dynasty until everything has been put under his feet. He has promised a dynasty as response to his own heart. He has proven to be someone who appreciates and grants God the glory that God, you put everything under my feet. What would someone with confidence in the flesh say? Remember King Nebuchadnezzar? I have made this empire by myself. And what did God do to him? Turned him into a wolf. Remember that? Shoved him into the grass, eating grass and long fingernails. Right? You know what I'm saying? And God is so pleased with David that he gives God the credit that everything's been put under him. And he proves that he believes this because he says, I want to make a house for you to be a legacy that you put everything under my feet. This was not done by my strength or by other people's strength or other men or, or whatever. It, it was certainly no other gods that did it. It was you that did it. And I want a house to celebrate your greatness. And God is so pleased with him. What does he say, guys? Will you build a house for me? I'm going to build a house for you. And he turns David's kingship into a what? A dynasty right there. Something he said he would have done for Saul if he would have obeyed. But he was a man who would put confidence in the flesh. And he shows it by all kinds of things. He even talks to the dead to pursue the living. Saul's a mess, but he's dead. But so what we need to understand is the Davidic, the Davidic throne is reflecting that God found a man from the pasture land, not very impressive, wasn't even lined up by his dad with his brothers to be considered as the future king. Completely passed over by his own dad. <laughs> He's like, do you have any more sons? It's like, uh, well, there's, there's the runt of the litter up there. <laughs> the pasture. Well, bring him in. <laughs> and, you know, it's like when your dad thinks you're not worthy of being king of Israel, then you're probably under the radar. <laughs> so to speak. <laughs> but anyways, the point being is, is that David is someone who wins all his battles. God is with him. And God puts everything under his feet. And by making him a, dy a, a dynasty, the hope of the Lord is this. It's one to honor David for his life and his commitment that after he dies, he cares more about God's legacy than his own. And two, that he will acknowledge to the entire nation, anything I am, anything I've become, God did it for me. God did it for me. That's a king worth following, wouldn't you agree? <laughs> it's awesome. So God then builds a dynasty. Uh, and, and the question is, though, is, 
is um, why? Because that dynasty, God is hoping, will continue to do what David did, which was force Israel, who are quite sketchy people, to not build idols or high places. And therefore, every king that comes after David is going to be judged on his willingness to cut down the high places. And some did, some didn't. Some were so evil they actually killed priests and prophets. But David is a standard bearer of all the kings coming down. Meaning these kings have one job. Use the power I gave you to make sure Israel keeps the law. They keep the law. You can't make, you cannot make them be faithful in their hearts. But you can stop them from building idols. You can stop them from killing people in the streets. You can stop the courts from being corrupt. You have the power. Use it. You have the power to take out evil men. You've got that power. Use it, David. Use it. Use it. That doesn't mean the people are godly. doesn't mean the people are good. But God gives them the power. Because remember, the Mosaic Covenant is not about believing primarily. It's about doing. And you're not going to be judged on what your heart is. You're going to be judged on what you do. If you build an idol, and if enough of you do, and people don't take you out, then you've done something that the Lord's going to punish the nation for. Okay? It's about doing. It's about obedience, don't get me wrong, but it's about doing. And that's why a king can stop you from doing things. So even though if your hearts aren't right, you will not be judged on your hearts. You are judged primarily on what do you do, both good and bad, in the body. And if I can prevent you from sinning through a righteous king, that's in your best interest. That is in your best interest. And so if you would build high places, and I know you would, I know you would, if there wasn't a David here, you don't get blamed for it as long as you don't do it. Because God does not judge you for what you could do, what you might do. <laughs> he judges you for what you do do. <laughs> Make sense? And so he knows if I have a righteous king that will not allow such despicable behavior, I won't have to drive these people out of this land. And he's hoping every king will be like David. He's hoping every king will be like David. What? But here's the problem. David's king, and that's awesome. But what is the struggle after he becomes king before he becomes the dynasty? He's king, then he's eventually promised the dynasty. But there's a struggle from the time he was anointed till he became king. And there's a struggle from the time he became king and his son Solomon was on the throne huge struggles. If God promised him, I will make you king, and that's all, then you won't understand the book of Psalms, the first 72 uh, Psalms. Because the first two, 72 Psalms primarily are not about David's struggle to become king. It's about his struggle that his kingship would actually truly end up being a dynasty. And that's why the first Psalm that actually pushes forward this section. This is not Psalm 1-2. Remember I said Psalm 1-2 is for the entire thing? But the first Psalm that sets the stage is Psalm 3. And that's a very difficult time in his life. That's when Absalom has turned on him. And if Absalom gets his way, are you following me? Then this dynasty is in trouble. In that, you've got usurper. And the dynasty cannot be built on usurping. It's one thing to hand your throne onto your son. It's another thing for a son to steal it from you. And Absalom wants to steal it from his dad. And as you know, Absalom is not going to be chosen. It's going to be who? Solomon. And Psalm 3 is the psalm about Absalom and the trouble of David then. Psalm 72 is the actual enthronement of King 
Solomon. So, so for your first two books, it is the struggle of Psalms that deal with the challenges for David to be uh, on the throne two the challenges of staying on the throne three the challenge to make sure the throne is handed to someone who's not usurping it and those that's basically your first two books Ch uh, psalm 3 all the way to 72 okay and god ends up winning the day you start the journey with a psalm that is so crazy it's like his own kids coming after him and it ends with him seeing Solomon in grand fashion put on the throne by God's choice through the prophet and anointing okay meaning God kept his promise that he would make him a what dynasty and the point is as we read these Psalms this happened two reasons one God always keeps his promise and two, David looked to no one but God to make sure that happened. David looked to God in his darkest hours consistently. And in the end, when it looked like it's going south, God, seriously going south, <laughs> God showed up at time and time and time again. Why would this be important for the people who put this book together? Because now they're in exile. Perhaps they've just come back and they have no king. Who is going to put someone on that throne? And the answer is, we should have the same faith that David had. God and God alone will in his time. Because none of us have the power to do it. And if we look to our flesh to do it, if we look to our own machinations to do it, it will fail. We have to have the same spirit and the same confidence that King David had in the worst of his days that God will keep his promise. Yeah, but we did wrong. That's why we're in exile. We had so much sin. And they would say, and so did David. So did David. David had a lot of sin. And David thought that his sin might get in the way of God fulfilling his promise. But the fact that his sin did not get in the way of God fulfilling his promise. Because clearly we're sinners, otherwise we wouldn't be in exile, would we? <laughs> Are you following me, guys? We wouldn't be in exile. And we wouldn't be without king right now unless our forefathers and ourselves have been, in God's mind, pretty despicable. So can our sin, will our sins, will our sins cancel any hope that we will have a future Messiah? And the answer will be no. Okay? So... The sign of the Davidic covenant. There's this. Yeah. 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 Um, this, uh, guys differ on it, but there is, um, there is a sense that the sign of the Davidic covenant moves in the direction of, of that God, that the temple will be built and there will be someone from your line on that throne. So the sign is of the Davidic covenant is a son from your loin will be on this throne. Yeah. Oh, because in, uh, in Genesis 49, um, Jacob is playing on the 12 names of Israel, punning them. Uh, taking the meaning of each of the son's names and giving a prophetic word on each of them. And in chapter uh, 49, it goes back to chapter 38. In chapter 38, Judah had a daughter-in-law, and uh, he had three boys, but born of, born of a Canaanite woman. 
he married a Canaanite woman, which he was told not to. Okay, because they, they didn't believe in God. And he had three sons, Er, Onan, and Shelah. Remember that? Right? And, and Er's wife was Tamar. And God killed Er because he was wicked. We're not told why, but he's just wicked. And his brother was supposed to raise up children for Er because you're permanently wicked if, if you don't raise up children. And he wouldn't. And so God killed him. And then there was just one boy left, Sheila. And he promised Tamar that, uh, go back to your father. And when Sheila's old enough, I will, I will give you to him. Well, he knew he, he wasn't going to do that. He, he, was, he had no plan. It says that he had no plan of doing that. He was a liar. He was making a promise to give up, in a sense, his one and only son. And he wasn't going to do it. And so he didn't. And she noticed that he was full age. And so she knew that she had, he had lied. And so she was just going to get this rascal. And so she acted like a temple prostitute, um, shrine prostitute at, at, at the crossroads, and sat there and waited for him. And he, of course, slept with her. And she got pregnant, and ba da 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 da. And um, lo and behold, they found out that, that Tamar was acting like a shrine prostitute, so he wanted her dead. He wanted to burn her uh, on a tree. Um, and she says, well, before you burn me, whose staff is this? Whose ring is this? Whose sash is this? And Judas realized, well, it's mine. And he said, she's more righteous than me, for I have, I have not given her of my son, Sheila. He withheld his one and only son. The other two are dead. But the point being is that story is linked to 49 because in both stories, God rejects the first three and goes with the fourth. Heirs rejected. Onan's rejected. Sheila's rejected. And it's Judah, actually, the father of, father-in-law of, of Tamar, who actually gives, um, gives her children. And she, ha and she has two children, Perez and, and Scarlet. Okay, burst and brightness. And in this story, there's three sons, Reuben, and he's rejected because he slept with his father's concubine. The second two are rejected because they broke their dad's word and slaughtered the people of Shechem when he gave them a promise of, of peace. And God goes with the fourth. So both stories are telling you that in the end, God chose the man who declared himself to have less righteousness than a temple prostitute. God chose that man to be the one that would carry forward the messianic hope. So it's not based on what? Human righteousness. If your righteousness is less than that of a temple prostitute, I would suggest that there's no reason for Israel, or especially the tribe of Judah, to be self-righteous, that the Messiah comes from them. Having said that, it says that Joseph is actually the chosen of the twelve. He's chosen. And you know he's chosen, and he is given the right of firstborn. It's not Judah who's given the right of firstborn, it's, it's Joseph. And we know that because he takes his tribe and splits it in two and makes it a double tribe. They get a double portion. And that's the declaration. All the boys will get one portion, but the firstborn son gets twice as much. And Joseph's tribe is doubled. And then God takes one of the tribes for himself, Levi. And so you actually have 13 tribes now, but it's never called 13. It's always 12. They always leave one out to make the point. And there's certain tribes they never leave out. But they always leave a tribe out because there's actually 13 tribes. But Joseph's is doubled. And that's why when they go into the promised land, they, okay, before they go into the promised land, but let me put it this way. When they go into the promised land, they are led under Joshua. Why Joshua? Because he is the leader of Ephraim, which is the tribe of Joseph. That's why you're led under Ephraim. Because Ephraim is the leading tribe. Now, Manasseh was older than Ephraim, but God rejected the first and went with the second. But they're both from Joseph. And Joshua leads Israel with Ephraim. And Ephraim are called the first, is, is the firstborn. 
and therefore their job is to fight the giants. They refuse. They will not fight the giants. And God, when, they, when Ephraim, the bowmen of Ephraim, refused to fight the giants because they were the firstborn tribe at that time, God rejected them as firstborn tribe. And he gave it to Judah. And Judah was given. God knew all this would happen ahead of time. There's so many examples where God rejected the first and went with the second. He rejected Ishmael and he went with Isaac. He rejected Esau and he went with Jacob. He rejected, he, like, he rejects the first. He rejects the first generation and goes with the second generation. And he rejects Ephraim and he goes with the tribe of Judah. And it's like, what basis of that would we know that that was always planned? Because Father Jacob, long, long before, promised that the scepter would come from the line of Judah, something he never promised Joseph. It was a promise to Judah. It was a promise to Judah when Judah was not the firstborn nation. Are you following me, guys? She ended up being the firstborn tribe because Ephraim was rejected because under its leadership, it refused to fight the giants. And God says, you have lost that status. Ephraim never accepted that and was upset about that. And so when after Solomon behaved badly and Rehoboam didn't listen to the older men and went with the younger men advice and it was split in two, naturally, who do you think would lead the other tribes? The one that was originally the firstborn tribe. It was Ephraim. Okay? Ephraim pulled 10 tribes with it. Okay? Because it originally, it was the firstborn tribe. Let me say it again. Ephraim is the second born, but declared firstborn of Joseph. Joseph is the 11th born. <laughs> but he is declared firstborn. How do you know it? Because his, tri his tribe is doubled, which tells you it's firstborn. But God rejects Ephraim because he would not fight the giants. Why? Because that's an understanding of putting confidence in the flesh. You looked at the walls, you looked at how big the giants were, and you said, we're not up to it. As if it would ever be up to you. No, I cannot have people lead my people who put confidence in the flesh. So A, all 600,000 men, none of you are going in. You'll all die in the wilderness. And Joshua, representing Ephraim, and Caleb, representing the tribe of Judah, you two men will have to wait until all these men die. And then you, who were in, in agreement, these two fine men were in agreement, only guys who spoke up for God, who were absolutely buddies, agreed to all the other tribes, don't do this, don't do this. But Joshua couldn't even convince his own tribe not to do it. And neither could Judah. But, eight, but the problem with Joshua, his tribe was the leading tribe. And God held them accountable. And gave them the responsibility of a failed firstborn tribe. Therefore, will not be so. And as you go into the promised land, they take out the enemies. They ask, which tribe should take the lead, God? And he says, Judah. Judah will take the lead. And that is where you know Ephraim has been replaced. Okay? But in uh, Genesis chapter 49, 10, right from the very beginning, long before any of this happened, God predicted that uh, there would be a kingship coming in the future, and he never mentioned its kingship coming from Ephraim or Joseph, only from Judah. Okay? And by the way, the word Judah means? Mm -hmm. the, yeah. The, 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 the actual word Yehuda, Yehuda means praise, and your brothers will praise you. It also means in Hebrew, submit, and they will submit to you because kingship is coming from Judah. And I will choose a man from the shepherds, from the fields, pasture lands, David, and he will be my shepherd from the tribe that you will praise and you will submit to. And I will put everything under his feet, including all the tribes. Okay? How are we doing? That was a good question, but... It's quite involved. 
Meaning, God sometimes prophesies something, but long before all the things that need to happen, happen to make it happen, including people have to make bad decisions. Like Ephraim has to make the decision not to lead the tribes when it should. But God knows all these things ahead of time. He is he's ahead of everyone. Okay? So let's, let's read Psalm 3. Oh Lord, how many are my foes? I'm getting tired of talking. Who wants to talk? Who wants to read this? Jack, read Psalm 3. Okay. The entire <laughs> David's entire world has just been rocked. His own son has gathered all the young men who come through the gate and convinced them to usurp his dad. Yikes. That's not how you get a dynasty moving forward. But read the psalm. Where does David find his confidence? the Lord. He looks around and says, God, there's tens of thousands of them that want my... <laughs> They're done with the old guy and they want to get a young guy. <laughs> this is a classic of how Israel saw David's Psalms as speaking to how they should view life. Will we ever be an independent people again? Will we ever rule, be ruled by one of our own? Will we ever have a chance to be back in the land and not be afraid of our enemies? We are among a people like aliens, and there's so many that would want to hurt us. And the psaltery would say, sing this song to remind you that when God that when David was in his darkest of hours, he looked to God and God alone to keep his promises. Because what had he promised him? That you will be a, a dynasty. You'll be a dynasty. Okay? What were people saying about David? Right. God has abandoned him. God has abandoned him. You cannot count on God, David. You, you cannot count on God. Clearly, if God was with you, your son would not rise up against you, nor the tens of thousands of people. David, if they took a vote, you would lose. You would lose. This is so important. What happened to Absalom, by the way? What happened to him? That's right, and he hung there, and then what happened to him? Yeah, jo yeah Joab. Just put him through. <laughs> Killed him. David didn't want his son to die, no question about that. But from Joab's point of view, I'm not willing to lose any more soldiers fighting this guy. This guy has caused us to fight wars and civil wars. He must die. And David was distraught that his boy died. By the way, this, this usurper, this usurper, okay, is caught in a thicket. No doubt is alluded to in the ram caught in the thicket. When the chosen one is as good as dead. David looks like he's as good as dead. But someone gets caught in the thicket and he dies in David's place. Who is it? 
it is Absalom. Everyone thinks David's going to die. Some people think David should die. And he's got some serious sins in his past. But in the end, it is Absalom caught in the thicket. And it makes a big deal about that. It's not like a little part of it. Remember Isaac when the knife was over him? What happened before the knife was over him? God says, don't. Good is dead. Don't. He says, Abraham, Abraham, do not harm the boy. And then he, he looked, and lo and behold, for the first time, he saw a ram caught in the thicket, and he took that one and he killed it instead of the chosen one. There's a lot of similarities. Okay? And that would not be something that, I mean, the Lord can work out Absalom to die any way he wants. Are you following me, guys? But to have him get caught with his hair in the thicket and die at a time when everyone thought David was going to die is a pretty good illustration that God was the one in it. Are you following me, guys? This is an, this is an indictment from the Almighty. This is an indictment from the Almighty. Absalom had no right to steal the throne from his father. Though he was a son of David, correct? Correct? Right? But dynasties don't work that way. Your sons don't steal them from you. It's still up to God who, who decides who will get the throne. And what is Absalom suggesting? Absalom is suggesting that God is not with who? David. He cannot find salvation in God. And his men are saying that, and everyone's saying that, and it looks like uh, that he is going to be right. But in the end, he is the one with his hair caught in the thicket, can't get out, hung there, and killed. When it looked like David was as good as dead. David was actually driven out of the city. Did not have time to even bring his royal clothes with him, and they were gambled off. That will be talked in the same book in Psalm 22. He seriously is in trouble. He describes himself as wolves and, or, or, or dogs and, and lions are ripping at his hands and his feet and pulling his bones out of joint like a shepherd in the fields. And he's so parched, he's got nothing left to fight. If God doesn't show up, he's as good as dead. And that's the point. When you think you're as good as dead and you put hope in God, Abraham will tell you, that's a good place to be. <laughs> that's a good place to be. The thing what you don't do is panic and look to your own machinations or other people to get you out of this problem. It's like Abraham being told, take your knife, put it over your son. Or Abraham, Get yourself and all your men circumcised on the same day in front of your enemies. It's like, God, wow. That's quite the plan. So what we need to understand is, is um, you're going to be going through some of the dark days of David and the belief that the people had that opposed him, that God was not with him. But what did God say about David? God had said, I took you from the pastors from the fields, and I put you on my king, and you're my shepherd king, and I have made with you an everlasting covenant. It is not for Absalom to challenge God's word. And if he were to kill his father and become king, he would be illegitimate because it would be based on his own flesh and his confidence than in the promise God has. In fact, his men and himself and much of Israel, especially the leadership of Jerusalem, their attitude is at this time in David's life, God is not with David. He is not with David. He is vulnerable. And David, in this psalm, makes it very clear that he was confident that God would deal with such people. He says, Arise, O Lord, deliver me, O my God. Strike all my enemies on the jaw. Break the teeth of the wicked. He doesn't say spank them. 
he says, put them in their real place. Not because he's vindictive, not because he's mean-spirited, but he knows that no one in Israel, including his own son, has the authority to challenge God's authority. That God has made a statement, and it's true. And even if there's tens of thousands, look at that, I will not fear the tens of thousands drawn up against me. Now that fear doesn't mean that he's not oblivious to it. We know from Psalm 22, and we know from other stories and historical books, he actually fled Jerusalem, which implies a little, a, some fear. <laughs> Correct? But fear, what he means by fear here is I have resolve that I don't have to do anything other than wait upon you to rectify this. And so when his men see men spitting on David and throwing dirt at them as he's leaving and his men want to kill those guys, David says, no, don't harm them. Leave them alone. May the Lord notice the curses that have come my way. Because maybe you'll have pity on me. That's the concept. That's just a man of God. Are you following me? It's like if you're going to run, you may as well run through a few real insolent you know, people that are throwing dirt and spitting on you on your way out. And he's like, no, because he's a true shepherd of the people of Israel. And he knows he brought this on himself. He said, God said to him, you, you stole that man's one you. And you had many yous. And you put a sword in his home. And Uriah died because of you. And I will make sure the sword is in your family and it will never leave. And David knows Absalom is a judgment for his past sin. He is a sword in his own family. He knows this. He knows this. And he will not take it out on foolish people that feel like they can throw some dirt and spit on the king on his way out. Because he's, he, he's fully confident that one day God will return him as king. And he believes he will come back and be on the throne. Because he has been given an everlasting covenant. Are you fo following me, guys? So you'd want to read the book of Psalms through the account of David's story with Absalom. When they, read the, when they do the psalm, okay, you have to understand, everyone who does the psalm, they know the story. They know the story at length. And they know the problem of Absalom, to a certain degree, was brought on by David himself. A, he wouldn't go out to war. He stopped going out to war, and Absalom was willing to do it. And that caused the young men to lose faith in him. There was all kinds of reasons for it. He brought some of it on himself. But in the end, David trusted God and it worked out. Questions? How are we doing? Make sense? How does this help people who are in exile or just coming back? It tells them that God will keep his promises but we have sinned against God God listens to the righteous we're the exiles who were kicked out of the land why would he listen to us well he listened to David because David repented and David told God he was sorry and if we do that too he will hear us too David becomes a symbol of the value of of owning your sin, of not putting confidence in the flesh, and believe that God will keep his promises. Okay? So that was Psalm 3. Many of these psalms that go through here are doing the same thing. A concept of, let's look at verse, um, Psalm 4, verse 1. Answer me when I call to you, my righteous God. Give me relief from my distress. Be merciful to me and hear my prayer. How long, O oh men, will you turn my glory into shame? How long will you love delusions and seek false gods? Know that the Lord has set apart the godly for himself. The Lord will hear when I call to him. In your anger, do not sin. When you're on your bed, search your hearts and be silent. 
David didn't just want exterior righteousness. He also wanted interior righteousness in his people. Offer right sacrifices. Trust in the Lord. Many are asking, who can show us any good? Let the light of your face shine upon us, O Lord. You have filled my heart with greater joy than when their grain and new wine abound. I will lie down and sleep in peace. For you alone, O Lord, make me dwell in safety. In all my travails, it is you who keep me safe. You have, you have been my peace. And notice this. Who can show us anything good from David's point of view? The most important good you could get is a glimpse of the face of God. Let your face shine upon us, O Lord. That is the symbol of goodness. Next one, give ear to my words, O Lord. Consider my sighing. Listen to my cry for help. My King and my God, for to you I pray. In the morning, O Lord, you hear my voice. In the morning, I lay my request before you. I wait in expectation. You are not a God who takes pleasure in evil. And with you, the wicked cannot dwell. The arrogant cannot stand in your presence. You hate, it's a strong word, all who are committed to doing wrong. You destroy those who tell lies, bloodthirsty and deceitful men the Lord abhors. But I, by your great mercy, will come into your house. In reverence will I bow down toward your holy temple. Lead me, O Lord, in your righteousness. Because of my enemies, make straight your ways before me. Make straight is the Hebrew word for righteousness. In fact, the word righteous is the word straight. It's one of the words for righteousness. And make straight is righteous. And righteousness is a synonym for the word salvation. God will make known his righteousness. He will declare his salvation. Please, God, make your salvation, your righteousness, your goodness shown to all my enemies. Because I have so many enemies. Not a word from their mouth can be trusted. Their heart is filled with destruction. Their throat is an open grave. This is quoted in Romans, by the way. Their tongue, they speak deceit. Declare them guilty, O God. Let their intrigues be their downfall. What David is saying is, this nation is under God, but this nation that I have underneath me, the vast majority of them, God, are not law keepers at all. This is a generation that does not know you, nor care. And you will see that David, his, his frustration with his people is he knows that without his power, they would do a tremendous amount of evil. And that bothers him. That's his indictment. That's picked up in Romans. Because if you're going to try and prove to the Jewish people that the law has not been able to make a difference, you'll get, the best thing to do is get David to tell you that. <laughs> because they love David. And David says, there's no one who does right. Not even one. That's an exaggeration for sure. But it's a statement that I look at Israel under me and this, this is not a godly place. It's so sad. I know, God, you want truth in our innermost being, but this is not what's in my generation. My generation is hard-hearted, okay? And they prove it, because once David's off the scene and Solomon comes on, they go right to the high places, and they go right to lots of women, and they start rebelling, and it's just a downhill slide. It's almost not even a slide. It's more like a jump off of righteousness, and David saw it coming, okay? So let's go to chapter 22. Continuing this theme of David being in trouble. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me, so far from the words of my groaning? Oh my God, I cry out by day and you do not answer by night and I am not silent. Yet you are enthroned as the Holy One. You are the praise of Israel. In you our fathers put their trust. They trusted and you delivered them. That is, you brought them out of Egypt. They cried to you and, and were saved. In you they trusted and were not disappointed. But I am a worm and not a man, scorned by men, despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They hurl insults, shaking their heads. This is described as David left his throne. And they're just 
truly insulted him. It says, he trusts in the Lord. Let, him, let the Lord rescue him. There's no belief that David's going to return. He's done. He's done. Let him deliver him since he delights in him. Yet you brought me out of the womb. You made me trust in you, even at my mother's breast. From birth I was cast upon you. From my mother's womb you have been my God. Do not be far from me, for trouble is near, and there's no one to help. Many bulls surround me. He's talking about the leadership of Jerusalem. Strong bulls of Bashan encircle me. Roaring lions tearing their prey. Open their mouths wide against me. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is turned to wax and is melted away within me. My strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. You lay me in the dust of death. Dogs have surrounded me. A band of evil man, men has encircled me. They have pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. People stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them as a cast lots for my clothing. But you, O Lord, be not far off. O my strength, come quickly to help me. Deliver my life from the sword. Here's the point. David is saying he has absolutely no reason to put confidence in the... Uh, absolutely. My bones are out of joint. My mouth is parched. You know, when an animal bites you, like that, it will bite you right in your hand. Your hand is from your elbow. Hebrew hand is from the elbow to the tip of your fingers. That's your hand. They'll bite you right there because you're warding them off. And they'll grab onto you and they'll pierce right through your bone. And then they'll pull it right out of socket. Every pro every, every, it's the shepherd's nightmare. And then you ward them off with your feet and they go clamp it right into your shin bone and they'll pull your leg right out of the joint. And David is expressing what it's like knowing from his shepherding days the horror of any shepherd to be tracked down by lions and dogs and wild pack of animals. And you're like, you are so done. And he says, that's me, God. That's me. And so he's used a metaphor of a shepherd out in the field that is so, so done. But it's a metaphor. It's a metaphor. But he's talking about, he's talking about powerful, powerful men. That's why it says bulls of Bashan. Powerful men. But unclean people. Dogs. People who don't care about God. Okay? Band of evil men. Okay? And so, but you, O Lord, are not, be not far off. My strength, notice he says, my strength. You are my strength. Confidence not in the flesh, but confidence in the strength of the Lord. To trust in him. Come quickly to help me. Deliver my life from the sword. My precious life from the power of the dogs. Rescue me from the mouth of the lion. Save me from the horns of the wild oxen. I will declare your name to my brothers in the congregation. I will praise you. God, if you save me, <laughs> I will go before the elders of Israel and say, the Lord and the Lord alone saved me. I did not get saved by my own strength. I did not get saved by my own machinations. I will praise you, Lord, among my own brothers. I'm confident I will. My days are not yet done. For he has not despised or disdained the suffering of the afflicted one. He sees himself as an afflicted one. Backing it up, he says, You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you seed of Jacob, honor him. Revere him, all you seed of Israel. For he has not despised or disdained the suffering of the afflicted one. He has not hidden his face from him, but has listened to his cry for help. From you comes the theme of my praise in the great assembly. Before those who fear you will I fulfill my vows. The poor will eat and be satisfied. They who seek the Lord will praise him. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord. And all the families of the nations will bow down before him. For dominion belongs to the Lord and he rules over the nations. All the rich of the earth will feast and worship. All who go down to the dust will kneel before him. 
those who cannot keep themselves alive. Posterity will serve him. Future generations will be told about the Lord. They will proclaim his righteousness to a people yet unborn, for he has done it. Now, you probably know this psalm quite well. It's used a lot where? In the Gospels. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Who said that? Jesus did on the cross. And who said the last verse? It is done. Jesus did. Jesus said the first line, and he said the last line on the cross. Because David is understood to be the afflicted one and a pattern of the afflicted one who also is God's anointed, who is also puts no confidence in the flesh, who also looks to God and God alone to protect him from the cruel and wicked leadership of Jerusalem that would have his neck. Both. Both. Oh, yeah. Both. Absolutely. Both. Yeah. Also, this one does, too. For example, here's another one that... I can count all my bones. Here's another one. I will declare my name, your name, to my brothers in the congregation. I will praise you. That's understood to be a direct quote from Jesus in the book of Hebrews. But that's also David. Martin Luther would like you to read that if anything looks like it could be Jesus, it should be nothing but Jesus. John Calvin is a little bit more subtle and said, I'm not sure I'd want to go that far. Liberal theologians say, if it's David, it has nothing to do with Jesus. Are you following me, guys? Our view would be God is more than able to work out David's life in such a way is his experience that it drives him through the prophetic word, through the ministry of the Holy Spirit, through inspiration, to cry out to God that would reflect the very heart cry of Jesus when he has the same situation. David does feel abandoned by God. But he puts his full hope in God. He says it very clearly. My trust is in you. My tr I wait for you. I, my trust is in you. But it looks like he has been uh, abandoned. That's also what the Messiah says. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus would want all of Israel to know that he was the David that was to come. Rejected by Israel, but given a dynasty by God. An everlasting covenant by God. Yeah, let's do that. Let's take a break. And feel free to bring back some questions if you have them. But yes, so Psalm 22 is... is uh, the answer is yes, both. <laughs> Big time, both. Big time, both. <laughs>
you take a look at this Psalm 22, whoops, that's a good Psalm. Turn with me to uh, Romans 5. Chapter 1, uh, chapter 5, verse 1. Romans 5, chapter 5, verse 1. Therefore, since you have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also rejoice in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character, hope. And hope does not disappoint us. Because God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom he has given us. You see, at just the right time, meaning the appointed time, when we were still powerless, that's the concept, no confidence in the flesh, Christ died for the ungodly. He did not die for godly people. Ungodly people. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man, though for a good man someone might possibly dare to die. The righteous man, the good man, is the same thing. It's, it's rare, but it can happen. There is such a thing as a righteous person and a good person. That doesn't happen to be what Jerusalem is, who's laughing at Jesus on the cross and mocking and spitting on him and yelling at him. They are not good men, and they are not righteous men. They're dogs. They're dogs. Evil men, a band of evil men around them. It's very important for you to understand that. But God demonstrates his own lo uh, love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He's not making the point there that you were born in sin. That's true of all of us. But when Jesus died, like David, they were vicious. Israel was vicious. They were sinners. And that's the technical term for me. Unbelievers. <laughs> They did not believe. They did not believe. You're born in sin. But God warns not to live a life as a sinner. Because a sinner, we, read a, we just uh, read a psalm, God hates all who do wrong. If that's, one, if that's your lifestyle and that's what you want, you'll get the wrath of God. That's what you'll get. Paul makes the point that the Messiah did not die when Israel was having a Bible study and hoping that God would show up and help them. <laughs> they put Jesus on that cross because they were a band of evil men. They were dogs. They were bulls of Bashan. They, they mocked him as he's dying. They were sinners. Okay? And, that's, and how do you know sinners? Because we'll say, well, and you'll say, well, everyone's sinners. That's not his comparison. His comparison was not sinners versus people who are perfect. It's sinners versus good people and righteous people. And someone might die for a good or righteous man. That happens once in a while. And there are good and righteous people. Now, it doesn't mean they have a sinlessness. We're all sinners in that sense, but that's not what Paul's talking about. Paul's talking about when the Messiah died on that tree... There's virtually no one believing in him. Just as when David is rejected by Israel. There is no one saying, but David's a good guy. Leave David alone. Look at the comments made about David in Psalm 22. All who see me mock me. That's what they did at the cross. They hurl insults, shaking their heads. And that's what the Bible says they did with Jesus on the cross. They also mocked Jesus. He saved others. Let's see if he can save himself. 
That's very similar to this phrase. He trusts in the Lord. Let's see if the Lord rescues him. Eloi, Eloi, Samachtani. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He's calling Elijah. He wasn't actually calling Elijah. He asked God in Aramaic. This is Hebrew. It's English. That's Hebrew. But he in, in Aramaic, he says this Psalm 22. And they think he's calling out to Elijah. And they run to get some help and see if Elijah will come and help him. And the whole idea is, again, this, just this mockery from beginning to end. And, and Paul says, concerning his own people, the Messiah came and he died. And he died for truly the sketchy. <laughs> he died for those who mocked him until his last breath. And what did Jesus say? Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. But the psalm is making the point. There ain't many around David that would speak well of him. And there ain't many around Jesus that will speak well of him. My God, my God, what... So again, the Psalms are so beautifully portraying David that his confidence is not in the flesh because he's got no one who will speak well of him. <laughs> There's no one that will praise him, but he will be among his brothers, fellow Hebrews, and he will praise the Lord because he is convinced that though God seems to have abandoned him, he'll be around. He'll be in the assembly, in the Sanhedrin, if you want to call it, and he will give praise to God among his brothers, the fellow, fellow Hebrew people. Okay? Uh, turn with me to Hebrews. Chapter 2. Verse 10. In bring many sons to glory... It was fitting that God, from whom and through whom everything exists, should make the author of their salvation perfect through suffering. And David calls himself the afflicted one in Psalm 22. That, you, that God will take note of the afflicted one. It's not about himself, but it's a prophetic word also for the Messiah, the afflicted one. Both the one who makes them holy and those who are made holy are of the same family. So Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers. He says, quoting Psalm 22, I will declare your name to my brothers in the presence of the congregation. I will sing your praises. Wow. The Hebrew writer understands that David's words are as if they came right out of Jesus' mouth. Because he is the one that God plans on putting everything under his feet. What did God put under Jesus' feet that he didn't put under David's feet? Death. Our final enemy. Death itself. It's like, wow. That's pretty impressive. Because David, I tell you, his tomb, Peter says, it's over here. And he's dead. <laughs> he's dead. I can most assuredly tell you that he's dead. And that's his tomb. So when God puts everything under David's feet, there's a sense in which God does put everything under David's feet. And that's the similarity. Are you following me? But the difference is, it wasn't actually everything. <laughs> Are you following me? There's a sense in which... The, what is so similar to Jesus to David? Because God put everything under his feet. What's the difference between Jesus and David? Well, it's actually death. He's dead. He's, he died. But Jesus is raised from the grave. On the, and he doesn't actually even get corrupted because God has even put death under his feet. That would be the theological difference. Remember, you always look for the similarity, but the theology is in the... Yeah, always. 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 Look for the similarity. Why do you need similarities? Without similarities, you won't make comparisons. And the Bible wants you to compare David to who? Jesus. And Jesus wants you to do it. That's why he starts the song and he finishes the song. Because he wants you to know he is, through his cry, he is identifying himself with King David. 
And what you're supposed to notice is all the similarities. But the theology will be in the what? In the difference. Because David actually didn't die. But Jesus did. But on the third day, according to circumcision, when he should be dead, as good as dead, he is uh, alive forevermore. Because God has even put death under his feet. Okay? And the principalities and powers that go with it. Let's turn to Psalm 32. Who would like to read Psalm 32? Yes, please. Okay, this is quoted in the book of Romans. Blessed is the man whose transgressions are forgiven. Notice the emphasis is trust. Trust. How do you get your sins forgiven? Hmm. Well, one way is stop buttoning up and keeping to yourself until God wears you out completely. <laughs> That's what David did. He hid his sin and held it on and God just worked on him until he sapped every ounce of energy in his life. And when God took him down and put a heavy hand on him because he wouldn't confess, then finally he confessed. So confession is the issue. It says... It says uh, for day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was sapped as in the heat of summer. It was just like I, I wouldn't, for whatever reason, I got stubborn and I wouldn't confess it. And I could feel the heavy hand of God just, just literally wearing me down. And I thought, who wants to have the heavy hand of God upon you? It's just going to make life literally miserable. So, then I acknowledged my sin. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> then I acknowledged my sin to you, and I did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. So, Psalm 32 is so important because it makes it very clear that the way to forgiveness is through con. Confession, but you'd only confess if you believed that a simple confession would get you forgiveness of sins. And happy is the person. Happy is the person. Blessed is the person. Um, increased is the person whose transgressions are forgiven. Okay? Then he goes on and uses this experience that he just acknowledged his sin and he gained back his joy and his strength that God was taking from him. And he encourages everyone else to do it. So you can see why this would be a psalm of the people in exile would want to know what do you need to do to get your sins forgiven because we can't offer any sacrifices. Because the only legitimate sacrifices, you need a priesthood and we are in exile without sacrifice, without temple. Are you with me, guys? And David points the way. It's always been. Even when you had 
sacrifices. Even when you had a temple, forgiveness of sins always came through what? Simple confession of sin, trusting in the Lord. You did not need to bring an animal to be forgiven. That's a mistake of evangelicalism. You needed to bring an animal for a sin offering if you wanted to go to the temple in the presence of God. That you needed to do. But if you were a man and you wanted God to forgive you right now because your God's hands heavy upon you, you just had to tell him, I'm so sorry, God. I'll admit what I did was wrong. And I'll tell whoever that I've wronged to make sure it's public to the degree it should be public. And so that is an encouragement to the people of uh, away, coming back, as they put it together, David is our guide. He knew the blessedness of forgiveness. And he's this great king. And he too messed up. And clearly we've messed up because we're in Babylon. <laughs> you got to be the messed up ones. And if it's not you, it was your dads or your older brothers. What a bunch of losers they were. Okay? And, uh, and you're the messed up ones. And you can't offer any sacrifices. And it's like, it's just no hope. And it's like, hold it. I think there's a psalm that says <laughs> that all you have to do is Confess your sin, and we will confess our sin. And we will ask God to keep his promise, because he promised us in 70 years we, will get, we come back. And he will not be late. Our God keeps his promises. He said we'll come back. But we also have to tell God we're sorry for our sin. Or you're going to feel the heavy hand of God upon you personally. He, you will not pretend you don't have sin or you will find no joy in your life no you will confess your sin like david did and find the joy the blessing of being forgiven because the opposite of finding the blessing of forgiving is feeling god's hand is just heavy upon you and he has very big hands if he's unhappy with you and can make your life feel like it's just hardly worth living <laughs> Good thing. <laughs> Good thing he's got big hands. Okay? And so um, this psalm is such an encouragement to the people to know that even without sacrificial system available to them, there is an there's, there's a possibility of forgiveness. It's an evangelicalism. It'll say, you know, in the Old Testament, people are only forgiven by offering animals. That is not what the Bible teaches. What it teaches is, if you have sin and you want to bring yourself close to the tabernacle, then you need to bring a sin offering. Okay? Or a guilt offering. The word sin offering is almost completely absent except for the idea of getting close to God at the tabernacle. So atonement, for example, in Genesis is whole burnt offerings. Sin offerings, not mentioned. The word sin offering and guilt offering come up because God wants Israel to know, if I'm going to live among you in a tent, just the fact that you have babies, you will need to bring a sin offering because you will have had an outflow of blood when you had a baby. And my presence among you is other. It's not earthly. So you must bring a sin offering when you give birth to a child. It doesn't even have to do with doing anything wrong. Are you following me, guys? Is there anything wrong in having a baby? Oh, exactly, it's not. But you have to bring a sin offering after you have a baby. Because it's God's way of saying, I do not want you to think of the Lord as if he's flesh and blood. He is not flesh and blood. And no one shall enter in the kingdom of heaven. Uh, 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 flesh and blood shall never enter into the kingdom of, of heaven. Okay? So let me say it again. The sin offerings, it, it, there needs to be far more theology understood of the sacrificial system. Because what we tend to do is we think every sacrifice must be about the forgiveness of sins. That's not the case. There's many reasons for sacrifices. But there's always been this understanding in the Old Testament and in the New Testament 
that if a person wanted to be personally forgiven by God, all you had to do was ask in faith and you'd be forgiven. Yeah. Confession. Yeah, you'd have to confess. Yeah. And it, it'd have to reflect a true contrite heart. I mean, a desire to actually change. It's not like just... That's right. Yeah. And the obedience there would be a confession that would come with, stop doing it. <laughs> stop doing it. But remember, though, uh, a sin offering is brought because you want to come to the tabernacle. But you're not going to go to the tabernacle. Uh, if you have a sin that you know, it says, let, I'll give you an example. The word chatat is the word for sin, so I'll just use it, okay? I'm not going to change all the Hebrew forms. I'll just leave them all as one so it's easier. If you have a chatat, which you chatated, then you bring your chatat and you de -chatat my altar and I will de -chatat you. <laughs> That's five chatats. That's true. If you have a sin which you've sinned and you bring your ram which you will call sin and you will take that ram, kill it, take the blood and they, the priest will spill it on the sides of the altar and you will de -sin your goop that's on my altar. You will cover your filth of your sin that is goop my altar. It will be covered with life, with blood of this animal and I will de -sin your sin from this altar and you will be forgiven. But it's all about keeping the altar cleansed. Because the altar is the means by which you get close to God. So if you want a special opportunity to draw nigh to God through the priestly sacrificial system and to get the experience of coming close to God, if you have a personal sin you've done, you would have to deal with it before you could come. You'd have to deal with it before you come. You could not, you would not be allowed to come and offer a fellowship offering when the priest knows. Yaakov, you slapped your brother. We saw it at the marketplace. You slapped him silly. It was wrong. Yaakov, take a hike. You're not going to offer a fellowship offering. Go get yourself a sin offering, Yaakov. Yaakov's like, <laughs> I want to offer a thanksgiving offering. You will not offer a thanksgiving offering until you first deal with your sin. God will not accept a fellowship offering on his altar from you when you have a sin which you sin. You go bring sin here and de-sin the altar and I'll forgive your sin. And then you can bring some fellowship offerings if you want. That's the priest's job. But if Yaakov simply wanted God to forgive him, are you with me? Nothing more. Please, God, I'm sorry for my sin. I will talk to my brother and apologize. You're forgiven, Yaakov. Lord, I want to bring a fellowship offering. Well, then bring a sin offering first because you polluted my altar. <laughs> sin offerings have to do with the tabernacle, the temple. So it's not wrong to understand all these things. Don't get me wrong. But the idea that you could not have fellowship with God except through the priest is crazy. The people of Israel prayed to God directly. They did not need a priest to pray to God. They prayed to God directly. It says that when Moses went into the tent and the, and, and the column of smoke came down, every man was at his tent worshiping the Lord at the entrance of his own tent. They were worshiping the Lord at his own tent. They did not need a priest to talk to God. What you're doing, if you do that, is you're trying to turn all of the Jewish people into Catholics. And they weren't Catholic. They believed very strongly. And even the Catholics don't believe that. A lot of people who feel like they have to talk to a priest, they also feel quite confident they can pray to God. Okay? So we need to be careful of this. Okay? But it is so important for you to understand that for Israel... Psalm 32 says this was necessary for God to keep his promises. That David did need to do what? 
confess his sin. God made this promise that he would be a man that would be a dynasty. But that did not prevent God from putting a heavy hand on, taking all the life out of him if he wouldn't do what's right. Life will get very miserable, David. You will feel my displeasure until you say sorry, first to me, then to those you've wronged. And then, David, when you do that, do the right thing and teach your people to do the same. And tell them, don't be stubborn like I was. <laughs> don't be like a mule. Don't be like a horse. If you find life heavy and you feel like God's not with you, confess your sin. All it takes is faith. Let's do 51. Let me say it again. It's in this section, 32. Why in the first two books? Because God is making it very clear that there was responsibilities on David's part. Okay? There was responsibilities. 51. Someone read it, please. So you can see that really these two psalms go together. Very much so. Notice in this psalm, it's about God, 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 God. And the other one, it was about the Lord, Lord, Lord. Remember I said there's two groups. And the word Lord is more in every psalm in the first book. And the word God is more than, than Lord in the second book. Just to tell you that it's just so very carefully crafted. And not one psalm in the second book would be rightfully placed in the first. And not one psalm in the first section would be rightfully placed in the second. 72 psalms, all in the right place. And he puts two, he puts two, one in book one, one in book two, to make it very clear that just because God gives you an everlasting covenant does not mean you do not have responsibility to live a life that is pleasing to him. And when you sin, you must confess. But notice what David is saying, again, the same concept, which is it is salvation that comes through confession, which tells you it is by faith. It is by believing. It is not by doing. It is not by doing. It is by believing. And David, in a sense, through this Davidic covenant, is giving you a great foreshadow of the new covenant. Because the Mosaic law is much more about doing than it is believing. But David says, but, but when it comes to being forgiven, it's much more about believing than it is doing. We need to believe. We need to believe that God will hear our cry. And he says, you don't want animals. Now, you have to understand, 
Some of David's sins, and this is one of them, was deliberate sin. And there is no sacrifice for deliberate sin. If you slept with some man's wife, God forbid, there's no sacrifice for you. You would be stoned and killed. And people under a rock pile generally don't offer many sacrifices. <laughs> you build an idol, you're a rock pile. There is no sacrifice for defiance in the Mosaic Law. David knows his sin is what? It's defiance. A man lost his life. And he lied and he slept with another man's wife. There is no sacrifice for such defiance. You're just supposed to be taken out and stoned. David knows. He lives by the grace of God. The law would condemn him. But if God determines... If God determines to take your faith and justify you when the law would condemn you, the law cannot disqualify you. Because what God has forgiven, God has for given. And even the law cannot condemn you. That is really a foreshadow of the new covenant. The law cannot qualify you, and the law cannot disqualify. The law can't save you. But if you have faith in God, neither can it condemn you. Because if God reaches in and takes your faith and declares it to be righteousness, then you have fulfilled the law. Because the law demands what? Righteousness. And he's granted that to you. Because of you have trusted in him. Let me say it again. You're out here, and there's no way you could possibly offer sacrifices Yet you would love to be forgiven. And if you looked at the law and what you've done, you are the offspring of those who worshipped idols. You are only saved by grace because of grace, because the law would have condemned you all to death. But God in his grace took those who trusted him as, as Jeremiah said to the people of Jerusalem, for example, go. Go to that land, and God will bring you back. And the people who believed Jeremiah's words, though he was hated by the, the, the leadership of Jerusalem, those who believed Jeremiah's words, they went. Those who put confidence in the flesh, they stayed in Jerusalem and fought and died. Who was, who was guilty? They were all guilty. But those who believed... Jeremiah's prophecy and said God has said he's handed us over to Nebuchadnezzar for 70 years <sighs> this really is terrible but we're going to go and we're going to listen to Jeremiah's words and we're going to go and I may never see this place again but I know my grandchildren will and I'm going to go for their sake and I'm going to go and I'm going to obey and I'm going to look to the Lord I'm going to agree with God and I'm going to expect God to show up when he says. And his heavy hand is upon us and boy do we feel his heavy hand and it's heavy but there will be forgiveness in the end and he'll bring us home. And he brought them home but he didn't mix them with those who stayed because most of the ones who stayed were he obliterated because they put confidence in the flesh and they said, Jeremiah, stop discouraging the people. We'll be fine. <laughs> we'll be fine. And they would not confess their sin. They would not acknowledge their sin. And God buried them, destroyed them. And so basically, faithful Jerusalem moved to Babylon. And there, no doubt, is where they put, they put together the book of Psalms, looking for the day they come back where God would restore the horn of David, Psalm 148, the horn of salvation, in Psalm 148. Okay? Any questions on that? How are we doing? Make sense? Questions? Thoughts? Feel free to... No.
No, I know. It's, 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 it's difficult. I guess what you need to understand is the Psalms is picturing David as? Yes, as the future Messiah. They would not fully know that, but he is pictured as the faithful disciple, follow his way. David was someone who did not put confidence in the flesh. Are you following me? And when he sinned, he confessed his sin. And when God rescued him, he gave God the glory. Are you following me? You know what I mean? When he had no reason to trust that God would keep his word, he did not go to others when it looked like everyone else said, God's not with you, David. And he was like, God promised me. He promised me that if I would love righteousness and hate wickedness, there would always be someone on this throne. And I've told God, I'm sorry for my sin. If he wants to take me out, that's fine. But he and he alone has that authority to do it. And I've confessed. And when he noticed that God saved him, he realized, he realized that he was a man as good as dead, but alive by the grace of God because he trusted in God. Psalm 51 is quoted where? Romans. It's all in Romans. <laughs> Let's quickly do it. Romans, chapter 3. Psalm 32 was in chapter 4, verses 7 and 8 of Romans. But chapter 50, uh, Psalm 51 is in chapter 3, verse 4. Let's read it. What advantage then is there being a Jew? Or what value is there in circumcision? Meaning, what value is there being part of the Abrahamic covenant? Much in every way. First of all, they were entrusted with the very words of God. The Gentiles had no scriptures. <laughs> the nations had no light of day. That's a huge advantage. What if some did not have faith? Will their lack of faith nullify God's faithlessness? Does God have to have every Hebrew that's ever lived believe for God to be faithful? And he says, no. Let God be true and every man a liar, as it is written, and this quote is from your Psalm 51, so that, so, that, so that you may be proved right when you speak and prevail when you judge. Their attitude is this. Paul knows that many of the Jewish leaders are saying, Paul, what you're saying is that God gave the law just to condemn everybody. To make it clear that everyone is condemned. And therefore that's ridiculous. Because God in the Abrahamic covenant promised that he would have a great nation. And you're saying the law doesn't save anyone. And Paul would say, no, there is no justification through the law. No one is going to be justified by the law. And they'll say, well, yes. So, so you got two choices, Paul. It's either the law saves you. Or God gave the law to get everyone condemned. And, and, and they build a straw man that way. And Paul knows that. He says, hold it. He says, what does David say? Why quote David? Why not Abraham? Because Abraham was not born under the law. He's of no use to you on this one. He was not born under the law. But David was born under the Mosaic law. Are you following me, guys? And therefore... And David is also their great king. So if David suggests something, it should end the question. See how, how powerful David is? Paul knows, if I can show you that David agrees with me, you're done. <laughs> His audience is, a, is, a, is an a, a, a antagonistic Jewish audience that says, your interpretation of the purpose of the law is ridiculous. God gave the law because through the law we find salvation. And he says, well... Let's find out what David says. <laughs> because how could God condemn you if he gives the law? It'd be like me giving you law because I know it's going to make you look good and me look, me look good and you look bad. Well, that's not fair. God has no right to judge me if he gives me laws that make him look good and me look bad. That's the argument. 
that the Jewish people are making. They're saying, Paul, it can't be that God gave the law for you to look bad and him to look good. That's too self-serving. Why would he condemn me for breaking the law if it just makes him look good? That is not the reason the law was given. That's their argument. So it's a little complicated. Let me say it again. God would not give the law to make you look bad and him look good while at the same time condemning you. Why would God condemn you if it just makes him look good? That's their argument. And Paul knows the scripture so well, he says, well, let's find out what David says. Because David actually in Psalm 51 explains the purpose of the law and God's right to judge. Let's look it up again, 51. That's why he quotes, he says, Have mercy upon me, O God, which would imply that God has the right to con them. If you ask for mercy, that implies that you're not asking for how you should be treated, but how you would like to be treated. <laughs> Correct? Have mercy upon me, O God. According to your unfailing love, According to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions, wash away all my iniquity, and cleanse me from all my sin. For I know my transgressions, and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. And this is what's quoted by Paul. So that you are proved right when you speak and justified when you judge. And that's the point. God, you gave us the law. And guys like me, we break it. And you are absolutely justified. Absolutely justified to bring wrath upon us because of it. But I ask God that though that is the case, that the law condemns me, that if I trust in Jesus, can the law condemn me? And God says, no, it cannot. It will not condemn me. Therefore, there is now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. But the law had the right, and I had the right to condemn you. Don't you ever forget that, Israel. And David agreed. Otherwise, mercy wouldn't be mercy. God gave the law to show you the sinfulness of sin and that you deserve to be condemned. It was that purpose. But it was never the purpose of the law to actually get you dead. It was to drive you to who will rescue me from this body of death. Thanks be to God for Christ Jesus my Lord. And David understands the law and God have the right to judge me. I have no question about that. May God be true and every man a liar. What he's saying is this. If all of Israel does evil, let God be true and every man a liar. And he takes the lead for Israel. And this is what these people need to do. The law will not save you, friends, but it cannot condemn you if you will confess your sins and ask for mercy. You will be forgiven and you'll come home. But it's interesting. When that's all said and done and everything's done properly, David's hope, because he's under the law, says this. Then there will be righteous sacrifices, whole burnt offerings to delight you. Then bulls will be offered on your altar. David was not saying that God was against sacrifices. He was against men assuming the law was given so that unrepentant sinners could just continue in their unrepentant sinning. God says, I did not give you the law so you could just deliberately defy me. No, the soul that sins, it shall die. And the law will condemn you and let every man be a liar and God be true. But know this, if you're tired of the heavy hand of God upon you, if you confess your sin and you ask for mercy, I'll give you mercy. This psalm makes it very clear the Davidic line did not continue based on David's righteousness. 
But it also did depend on David's righteousness because he had a righteousness that was given to him by God through grace, uh, by grace through faith. Does that make sense? It was a righteousness given by God through confession because he believed that God had the right, A, to condemn him, and B, that he could also choose to be merciful if he wanted to. And God shows mercy. And that's why Solomon ends up on the throne. Because God chose mercy. Amen? Amen. And that's why those people are going to come back from exile. Because God's going to choose mercy. Because he'll keep his word. And his word was, in 70 years, you're coming back. But that does not change the fact they need to deal with their sins if they're going to come back. And they did. And God stirred up their spirits and brought them back. Someone going to close in prayer? Okay.